Welcome to ECE 340. This is the review session for exam number three. And just so that you are, we're all on the same page tomorrow when the exam hits, the process is been being displayed before the lecture, or before this session. And it's essentially three sheets of notes plus the copy of table 4.1 in the textbook, and that's Laplace transform tables. The other material is the same or consistent with previous exams. For exam number three, the topics, don't forget that there could be block diagram manipulations or all integrator block diagrams relative to transfer function, state space, etc. If you are given a transfer function, can you find an all integrator block diagram? You might go back and look at previous exam number twos. The, they might have some problems on block diagram or all integrator block diagrams. That's what I'm expecting you to be able to do. The textbook sections for this material, some of four and some of six. Some other topics that you need to be comfortable with is the ch section 10 material in chapter four, which is filters, the different structures of a band pass, band reject, low pass and high pass, and how do you design a filter in terms of filter order, and how do you select the poles? And typically we're gonna be doing Butterworth pole patterns. How do you pick those distribution of poles? Also, there'll probably be some, a question on how do you combine signs or sinusoids and when do those end up being periodic? How do you make that determination? Obviously, there'll be some Fourier series, which is the chapter six material, six, one, two, and three. So let's get into some of this that we haven't spent as much time on, and in particular, sums of sinusoids or sinusoidal sums, and when are they periodic? Suppose that somebody gave you x of t that was, let's say, 3 cosine of 6 over 5 t and 4 cosine of, let's say, 7 over 9 t plus cosine of 12 over 21 t. And now you need to find out if it's periodic, and if it is, what's, let's say, the fundamental frequency? And then you could identify the harmonic content that each of these signals represents. Actually, this one, since they are rational numbers already for the frequencies, you can say that it is periodic. Now, the important thing is, what's the fundamental frequency? And that you will be looking, and the important thing to do here is to actually, if the ratio is not in lowest terms, put it in lowest terms before you start doing this calculation, meaning reduce the frequencies to lowest terms, and I hope you know what that means. Just factor out the largest common multiple in the numerator and denominator of the frequencies. Reduce the frequencies to lowest terms before you find the fundamental frequency. And in particular, that last ratio is not in lowest terms, 12 over 21. There's at least a three that's common to the numerator and denominator. And if you don't reduce it, then you may not find the highest value of your fundamental frequency. And so your harmonics, you're not going to miss frequencies. You just might say, oh, you have the 15th harmonic when in fact maybe you just, it's really the fifth harmonic and you've got your fundamental too low in frequency if you haven't 
factored out the common terms. In this case, we're looking to find the greatest common factor of the numerator terms. And so we have now factored, factoring 6, which is has factors 2 and 3. And then we're going to take that over the largest common multiple of the denominator factors or the denominator terms. In this case, we have 1 and 5 for the factors in the denominator of that first one. Then if we look at the second one, it was 7. That's 1 and 7. Actually, I guess we could put a 1 in there for the 6 because 1 might actually be the greatest common factor among all of these. In terms of the denominator, I think the previous denominator was 9, so that's 3 and 3, or 3 times 3. And then what we should do with this 12 over 21, maybe we, we should reduce that so we have the threes cancel and we really just have this 4 over 7 to worry about and so now we have 2 times 2 or 1 times 2 times 2 and down below we have 1 times 7 for its least common multiple. So the greatest common factor for this particular case what factors or terms in those factors are shared or are common in the numerator. There's just the one. That's the only common factor in the numerator pieces, and so that's the greatest. Downstairs, we're looking at what are the terms that we need to form a product of to give us the least common multiple, and that's now 9 times 5 times 7, whatever that ends up being. What is that? 30 times 7, or 210? Oh, oh, I, I left down a 9, or a 3, didn't I? So we have 9 times 5, which is 45 times 7, which is 315. So that's now the fundamental. The omega naught is now 1 over 315. And if you wanted to know what harmonic 6 over 5 represented, now that's going to be the fundamental times some harmonic n, let's say n sub 1. And you would then solve for n sub 1 and find what harmonic that represents. And you know it's going to be huge because 1 3 15th, there's 315 of those before you get to 1, and 6 over 5 is bigger than 1. So this is going to be a huge harmonic of that common frequency. It takes quite a while before these particular terms in this sinusoidal sum start to repeat just because of the different frequency content in that expression. Questions on that? Is that clear, how to approach those kinds of problems? What's another term on the docket? Suppose that we now looked at a, the following problem. Maybe somebody says, what if I gave you the following? What if I gave you x of t equaling cosine of 2t plus cosine of 4t plus cosine of 20t, and they said pass that through a system that has h of s equal to s squared plus 4 over s cubed plus 12s squared plus 25s plus 50. 
and they wanted to know what's the output. And maybe this X has been happening forever, and now you want to know what's Y of T, or you might be looking to say what's intuitively what's happening. What would you expect the output to look like in the sinusoidal steady state or Y of T? Would you expect to see all of those terms or frequencies and would they all be at the same sort of, would they all be favored equally? What's really going on here? And so you might want to know what's happening relative to these frequencies. You have three frequencies, 2, 4, and 20, and you might like to know what information is contained in H of S. And you could find the Bode plot of that if you wanted to. For this exam, what I want you to be able to do is actually find, let's say, an all integrator block diagram for H of S before you even do that process. But the, the global question might be, y of t, where y and x are related by this representation or this system. x is the input, h is the system, and y is the output. But for now, let's just see if we can create an all integrator block diagram for that transfer function h of s. That's a problem you might expect on the exam, something like that. You now know that this is I'm sorry? You could expect to be asked, given this relationship of expressions, which it could be as straightforward, it may be a little bit more elaborate than just giving you a transfer function, what is the all integrator block diagram? In this case, we had s squared plus 4 up top, and we had s cubed plus 12s squared plus 25s plus 50. If we cross multiply now we have the relationship of the input and the output in the frequency domain. We can immediately take that into the time domain. We now have the third derivative of y plus 12 times the second derivative of y plus 25 times the first derivative of y plus 50 times y is equal to the second derivative of x plus 4 times x. Realizing or remembering that multiplication by s in the frequency domain is consistent with differentiation in the time domain. If we pull all of those over to one side, which we can do pretty quickly if I simply did the following, if I just changed the signs on some of these, <laughs> so now I have all of this, all of these non-zero terms combined in the manner that that system needs to behave or operate and they're equal to zero. In this form, what I want to do is assume that I now have access to the input x and the output y, such that I can now, sub if I subtract 50y of t and add 4x of t to the left-hand side, I can do that in the block diagram, and I can now say here is a summing junction which I'm going to put in 4 times x, and I'm going to subtract 50 times y. Which now leaves me with, if I add the blue and the green together, 
the result will come out of that summing junction on the right, and the result is now y triple prime of t plus 12y double prime, hopefully I'm remembering this, plus 25y prime of t minus x double prime of t is equal to zero. Whoops, that's not equal to zero, so I'm not even going to say that. That's what I have coming out of this summing junction right here. So I could maybe call this beta. Now what I want to do is integrate it once and coming out of that integrator, let me call it beta 1, is now equal to the second derivative of y plus 12 times y prime plus 25y minus x prime of t. Now what do I want to do to this signal, beta 1, in order to start getting closer to what I want to end up with at the very end, which is y? I have y and x available to me. If I now subtract 25y from that, I now can say, okay, going in to the summing junction was beta 1. I want to now take away 25y of t, and that will now help reduce this down to where now I have y double prime of t plus 12 y prime of t minus x prime of t. And if I integrate that, coming out of that, let me call that beta 2. Whoops, that was now beta 2, wasn't it, right here? This is now beta 3. Beta 3 is the integral of that, which is now y prime plus 12y minus x. And now I can take 12y away from that and add in x from beta sub 3. I now take this x and add that in. I take minus 12 times y away from beta 3, and now coming out of here, I'm left simply with y prime out of that last summing junction, which if I now integrate that, I end up with y of t, and that's what I said I had down here. And that's now my block diagram for that original system. Which if I inject x, now that's going to allow y to be generated. I mean, if you were just doing this with MATLAB, you would create x of t, put in the h of s, and do a linear simulation, and you have the output. But Based to demonstrate your knowledge of what we've been talking about, I might have you construct an all integrator block diagram from a transfer function. Or you might now need to find, I might give you a block diagram and say, give me a state space representation. How would you do that? If I gave you this as a block diagram, how would you build a state space representation? from this block diagram. What's the strategy? So you define the output of each integrator is now a state variable. 
There's Q1. Here's Q sub 2. And there's Q sub 3. And now you can build up Q1 dot out of Q1, Q2, and X. And build up your state space representation. Questions on that? If you actually took that H of S and found the roots, you would find that you had zeros at plus and minus J2 and you have poles at, now I forgot where I put them, minus 1 plus and minus J2 and minus 10. And you should be able to sort of see where those are in the complex S plane. You now have minus 1, And plus and minus J2, you have something over here at minus 10. You have three poles, and you have two zeros. And those zeros are right on the imaginary axis. What kind of a behavior do you think that would give you? Is this transfer function proper or strictly proper? It's strictly proper. So what's happening at high frequencies? What's happening to the what's happening to the magnitude at high frequencies if it's strictly proper? It's sloping down, isn't it? It's rolling off minus 20 dB per decade. Now, what's going to happen? Well, this is a little interesting, isn't it? We would sort of have to be thinking about what's going on in the this play of poles and zeros near J2. But if you now had to sketch just the Bode plot of those zeros, what would that look like? Can you identify where the magic would be happening? If this is omega, can you say anything about sketching that zero behavior, what might be happening? So now something magic is going to happen at 2, isn't it? And in this particular case, what's happening? Or what's one way that you know at high frequencies what's going to happen? What's going to happen at high frequencies? With the zeros? The zeros do what? They go up, don't they? They're upstairs. So now this zeros at high frequencies, and there's it's complex, so now you're talking 40 dB per decade, right? And right at 2, what's happening? If I, if I was walking along that imaginary axis, looking at the big top tent above me, what happens when I step on J2? What have I stepped on? I've actually stepped on the thumbtack, haven't I? And that's right at zero. So in a Bode plot, zero never happens. It's going off the... If it was close to the imaginary axis, it would be doing something like this, wouldn't it? 
But since it's right at the imaginary axis, it's going off to never never land and then coming up there. That's the zero pattern. And the pole pattern is sort of doing the opposite, isn't it? The poles now, if I threw those on here, they would be doing something like this. And then if I I'm and then I have this guy. And what's he do? He starts rolling off at 10. So now you would have to combine all of those. Meaning the combination, I don't know what color to draw this. I've used up too many colors. Would be something like this. It would go down and then it would sort of roll off. And in fact, that's what happens. I don't know if I remember which figure is which. That's now the Bode plot of that particular transfer function. It's a notch filter with high frequency roll off, but the roll off is not very great relative to this scaling on the vertical axis of the magnitude plot because. This is trying to capture minus 300 dB. It's going crazy. And this is rolling off at 20 dB per decade. But that's something that you would have expected to see in terms of the Bode plot behavior of that transfer function. That's maybe sort of an aside, but you know that it's. strictly proper, so you know you have this high frequency roll off and you know you had a DC value, a DC gain. What's the DC gain of that transfer function? What's H of J zero? 4 over 50. So it's quite a bit less than 1, isn't it? It's smaller than 1 12. So it's, it's pretty tiny and that was being demonstrated if you looked at the DC gain you were a little bit below 0 dB. You were 20 log of 4 over 50 below 0 dB. Questions on that? Let's talk a little bit about low pass filters. And what you need to concentrate on are the pole patterns consistent with the Butterworth. Butterworth patterns mean what relative to the poles and the origin? How are the poles distributed relative to the origin in a Butterworth pole pattern? They're the same magnitude away, they're the same radius away, and then if you looked at the constellation, how would they be you keep the ones in the left half plane and what I was looking for is they're symmetric with respect to the origin, all of the poles. So what I was wanting, what I was fishing for is that this Butterworth means that we have symmetry of the poles with respect to the origin and how are those poles distributed? What's our key formula? If we have an nth order filter, we have 360 over 2n. And that's going to give us all of the poles in the complex S plane, and we don't retain the ones that are unstable or in the right half plane. 
Now I may ask you to give me the order of the filter, maybe not directly. I may not specify it directly. I could do it in an indirect manner. For example, what if I gave you phase information and maybe I said something about the high frequency phase. Now we're dealing with a low pass filter so we know we have our numerator is constant and all of our roots are in the denominator. What if I said as an example, what if I said the high frequency phase is minus 360 degrees. Could you tell me the order of the filter based on that information? Now you have four, don't, right? So this is now n is equal to four or fourth order. Each pole contributes 90 degrees and they're in the denominator. So we have four going into, well, minus 360 divided by minus 90 gives us 4. What if I was doing an indirect filter specification by the magnitude information? Again, let me look at the high frequency. For example, maybe I could give you the roll-off rate. If I said minus 60 dB per decade, what's the filter order? So now you know it's third order. If I said minus 24 dB per octave, Now we have a fourth order. Remembering this octave is a factor of two. Question? Now how did I get the order of the filter from the high frequency phase? Each pole is contributing 90 degrees and it's a pole so we're subtracting that. We, each pole factor gives us minus 90 degrees. And so now we're basically dividing whatever the high frequency phase is, we're dividing that by minus 90 and whatever number results is our filter order. That's the phase, each phase or each pole factor at high frequencies contributes minus 90 degrees. And remember that an octave is how big? It's a factor of two. And a decade how big is that? That's a factor of ten. Just like a, a decade in time. That's ten years. All right, so now so let me give you another problem relative to maybe designing a filter. Suppose I give you a signal x of t, and that's equal to cosine of 5t plus 1,000 cosine of 20t. In this signal, Let me say this is my info signal, or I want to keep that, and maybe this is what I really would not like to have as much interest in. So maybe I call this the noise. But in this case, the noise is really, really big <laughs> relative to the signal, and I may not like that. And I now want to design a filter that will at least put them on equal ground. So now, suppose that somebody tells you 
that's the cutoff frequency. And I could do this indirectly, and I've done this on previous exams. I might say, oh, the cutoff frequency is an octave above the signal frequency. Or I might have multiple components in the signal frequency. Let's just say that you're given the cutoff frequency for today, and it's 10 radians per second, which is an octave above the signal's frequency, or the information signal's frequency. And it's actually an octave below the noise. So now, how are the noise and the signal related in terms of magnitude? If I just looked at the magnitude of the high frequency, and I looked at that ratio relative to the, so this is now, <laughs> you don't hear this, this is the noise to signal ratio. Usually you hear signal to noise. But here I'm looking at the noise to signal ratio. And this, usually you like to see this the other way around. You like your signal to noise ratio to be much larger. Here you have a noise to signal ratio of 1,000. Your noise is 1,000 times in magnitude larger than your signal. Not a good thing. So if you wanted to find that in dB, you would say, oh, your noise to signal ratio in dB is 20 log of 1,000. And what's the log of 1,000? That's 3. So this is now 60 dB. Maybe we want to put those on equal footing. We want to make the noise at least the same sort of order of magnitude as the signal. What are we wanting to do then in terms of filtering? Is this making any sense? Kind of making this up, but what do we want? So now we want to pass the, the signal. And if we pass the signal, that's saying keep its magnitude the same. And what did we, so our signal is right here, let's say at 5. Where was our break frequency or cutoff? It was at 10. So here is our break frequency, omega sub c. And our noise was out here. And if we want to put the, these on equal footing, the magnitude of the noise and the signal after we filtered it, what do we want to do? We would like to be down We would like to reduce the magnitude by 60 dB by the time we hit our noise frequency of 20. Meaning if we now sketched a magnitude plot, we're going to be breaking here and we want it to be below minus, well, our filter needs to be this way so that it attenuates our signal by 60 dB, which now puts us at about the same level at the filtered output side as what our input is in the signal at 5 radians per second. What's that telling us then? So we want more than 60 dB of attenuation in one octave, which is the separation between 10 and 20. That's an octave. And we want to knock that down by 60 dB or at least have more than that.
and I think I heard the answer already, right? Each order of the filter, n equal 1, gives you 6 dB per octave. And we need 60. So now for each order, we need it's going to take 6. We divide 60 by 6, and we get a 10th order filter. And the reason that we were doing that or seeing that is that each, I'll just say each real pole factor, each individual pole provides 6 dB of attenuation in each octave. Now, what's the pole separation in the complex S-plane for that, let's say, for a tenth order filter? Pardon? So we now have 360 divided by 2 times 10. So that's now 180 divided by 10, or 18 degrees. So we have quite a few poles plastered in our complex S-plane. Pardon? And none of those are on the real axis, are they? Because we have a real, I'm sorry, an even numbered filter. N is equal to 10. Meaning we now have, if we had to schematically sketch this in the S-plane, we have five poles in the second quadrant, five in the third quadrant, there's 18 degrees between those, which means that right there, is 9 degrees. So we would go 9 degrees up and then the next one we go to would be 18 degrees. Then another 18 degrees. Another 18 degrees and another 18. Did I get... That looks okay. Well, I mean, I'm sure it's not right, but it's the right number. It's supposed to be a semicircle. And what's the radius of that circle for this filter that we've de designed? Do you remember what our cutoff frequency was? It was 10. So we would need to scale those. If those were normalized to have a radius of 1, we would need to scale those by this factor of 10. Questions on that. Yes, no. Yes. How do we know the radius is 10? We now need to scale. We wanted a cutoff frequency or a break frequency of 10. And in our Butterworth pole pattern, when we just find the, no, the normalized set of poles, they're all at a distance of 1 away from the origin. We now need a bandwidth of 10, so we now need to expand that radius by that factor of 10. If we wanted a bandwidth of 26, then we would scale it by 26. That radius would have been 26. Does, does that answer your question? And then how do we scale? If we have H of S as our normalized filter, how do we make that have a frequency, a cutoff frequency of 26? Everywhere we have an S, we replace the S with S over 26. Right? So if we had S to the 10th, 
we would replace that with s over 26 to the 10. Did I see another hand somewhere? It's essentially, that's all of your poles. If the easy explanation, what's the relationship between the radius of the poles or the distance away from the origin and the cutoff frequency? The easiest explanation or the most direct would be if I gave you this, where's the pole? Minus 10. And where's the break frequency? 10, right? So this is now going to give us in the S plane we now have that pole at minus 10 and if we sketched the Bode plot that break is at 10. Now what did we do when we had a second order filter? The normalized might look like s squared plus the square root of 2s plus 1. But if we wanted that to have a bandwidth of 10, well, this now, where are my poles? How are they separated? 90 degrees. Do I have any on the real axis? I can't because I have an even filter order, which dictates that these have equal real and imaginary part. The poles are 45 degrees away from the real line. And in this case, that radial distance is 1. But if I now expand, if I want a break frequency of 10, I expand that out to a radius of 10. Is that helping? So that's where that radius comes from. That's where our break is going to occur. Let's talk a little bit about, are there other questions before I move on? So now the question was, when do we do this approximation of the cutoff frequency as the imaginary frequency? In this exam, we're not going to be sketching Bode plots per se. You're going to be drawing the magnitude and frequency shapes on more of an absolute scale in terms of what is this? Well, I guess if you sketch the, bo the band pass or the low pass or high pass, you can do the quick magnitude responses. But in this particular section of the class, don't get too hung up on let's rotate those poles to the real line. I think that's sort of what you're asking maybe as far as how we quickly sketched quadratic poles or zeros in Bode plots. Now I want you to sort of keep those poles and zeros in their true location and you're not going to have to get too exact with your Bode plots. Okay. Now, the Fourier series is available to us because we're dealing with periodic waveforms. Once we have periodic waveforms, then you can now start finding the Fourier series representation. And we have all sorts of Fourier series representations, don't we? We have the trigonometric, we have the compact trigonometric, and we have the complex 
exponential. And I want you to be able to go back and forth between these. And that's essentially, you better be very comfortable with table 6.1 and that could be a part of your crib sheet. The trigonometric gives you A's and B's. And now you're saying, how is my X of T, my periodic waveform, how is it correlated with sines and cosines? And once you have A's and B's, you should be able to find the compact trigonometric form. If you now have the compact trigonometric form, you can start thinking about line spectra with either the complex exponential or the compact trigonometric. In the compact trigonometric, that's a one-sided line spectra. Meaning now, if you're given a periodic waveform, one of the first things you need to do is find omega naught, the fundamental frequency. So if you can find the period, the length where it starts to repeat, now you have omega naught. And once you have omega naught, now you know what harmonics are possible. It's only going to be these discrete frequencies that occur for a periodic waveform. And this is now the magnitude of those particular frequencies. You can also have the phase. Could you have a phase at DC? You could have a negative number, couldn't you? You could have a negative DC value or a negative average value and then you have a phase at DC and that's going to be plus pi or minus pi. You can decide what you want it to be but you could have a angle at DC. Is that clear? Typically we have just a positive offset, but you could have a negative offset DC value in your X of T. It's possible then that you might have this down at minus pi. Then you might have an omega naught at some other value. Maybe that's pi over two. Maybe this angle is pi over 4. And if I gave you omega naught, and maybe these are 0. If I now said omega naught is 3 radians per second, you should be able to give me x of t. Question? If you now have a negative value at DC, depending on what you have remaining in the rest of your phase, if all of your phases are plus and minus pi, you might want to just say, let me allow C sub n to assume negative values. And then you wouldn't have to plot the phase plot. You could just say, oh, when it's negative, I'm going to actually plot that as a negative value. And then you've captured the phase information in your amplitude. So people get kind of particular on what they say, magnitude, amplitude, plot. I've just been sort of blurring that and just say, let's just say we have the magnitude and it's only positive. But if you allow it to be negative, you could then say, oh, if all of my angles were plus and minus pi, then I wouldn't need to keep track of the phase. I could incorporate that with a negative value in my amplitude. Is that making sense? 
meaning here, depending on what that is, if that's now, let's say that's 2, now you could write x of t as minus 2, or you could say 2 cosine of pi, or 2 cosine of minus pi. And there's no omega naught t there, it's at dc. But then your next one would be, let's say, 1 and a half cosine of omega naught. What did I say that was? 3 in this example. So now your, sec your first harmonic, your fundamental, is now 1 and a half cosine 3t plus pi over 2. And now you just keep adding those terms. Question? No, the, so, so if you look at table 6.1, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but the DC term doesn't get modified between these different representations. You, if you're going from compact trigonometric to exponential, all the harmonics get cut in half, but the DC is going to be the same value. And you also now have frequencies in both the positive half and the negative half of your frequency axis in the complex exponential. And in the phase, now you have odd symmetry with the phase. You could now have the same phase for the positive frequencies, but for the negative frequencies, you have their odd versions. The phase is an odd function. The magnitude is an even function. Is that okay? And I would like for you to be able to, if I gave you this, I would like for you to be able to sketch the complex exponential line spectra. The other thing that you should be able to do, if I now give you this, or maybe I give you a periodic waveform, x of t, and if I give you a system, h of s, Now, whatever this system is, let's say that this system is such that it has that for its magnitude behavior. It's maybe ideal. If your H of S behaves like an ideal bandpass filter that passes the second, the third, and the fourth harmonic, can you tell me what the amplitude or what your output is going to be. I would have to tell you what this is, wouldn't I? How is it scaling each of those components? Maybe it's flat, maybe it's some weird shape, maybe it is a function of frequency. But you now have to calculate the complex number h of j, 2 omega naught, and that will tell you how you're impacting the magnitude and angle at the second harmonic. You would also need h of j3 omega naught. Is this making sense? This is now going back to this concept of sinusoidal steady state behavior. What happens when you hit a system, now I need to go get the trash can and shake it. When you shake that trash can at a given frequency, you're going to get that same frequency out. You're just going to, the system will simply change the amplitude and maybe the angle or the phase. And you could have that occurring at these three different frequencies. Is that clear? I want you to be able to do that. I want that to be straightforward for you to be able to do on the exam. I could give you a transfer function. I could give you a block diagram, couldn't I? I could give you an all integrator block diagram. I could give you a periodic waveform. And now I could say, what's y of t? That's what I said. I'm not going to repeat that. It's a good problem. So the, final, the third exam could be just one question. And I'm hoping you miss the very first part, and then I don't have to grade anymore. No, I want you all to ace the exam three. But it could be one problem. It could be, given x of t, 
which is a periodic waveform. Since it's periodic, what do you know? You can find a Fourier series representation, and you could pick your favorite Fourier series representation. Now I give you a system. I could give you a system in a state space form. I could give you a system in a transfer function. I could give you a system in an all integrator block diagram. And now I could say, what's happening at the output? And there's all sorts of ways that you could give me, well, now the process is find the Fourier series. Now you have the lines. You now know the frequency content. I give you a periodic waveform. The first thing you might want to do is find the frequency, the fundamental frequency. Now you know that the only frequencies that you can have associated with that periodic waveform are going to occur potentially at these harmonics. You're not going to have something right there between 2 omega naught and 3 omega naught because it's periodic. You can only have harmonic content. That's what I want you to start remembering or thinking about or intuitively realizing. Then you need to figure out, okay, what's my system doing to this set of frequencies? And you can find how it behaves by evaluating H of J, whatever frequency you're interested in. If I say, give me the output's power at the third harmonic. Now you need to find the third harmonic, find what the input value is for that. How does that amplitude get scaled by the system? Let's just pick some numbers. Let's say that this is 1.5 and I want to know power in outputs third harmonic. And I'm going to say, let's just go ahead and say omega naught is, th well, maybe that was a poor choice because I have too many threes. Threes are wild here. So let me pick a different omega naught. Let me say, yeah, square root. Let's say this is now five. Omega naught is five. What's the frequency that I'm interested in? That's now the frequency of interest. And maybe I've now found that C sub 3 is 1.5, and maybe theta sub 3 is 45 degrees. That I could have found from my line spectra or my compact trigonometric Fourier series representation. Does everybody know what that means? So now my third harmonic in X looks like 1.5 cosine of 15T plus 45 degrees. I now need to tell you or you need to know what is H of S. Maybe now you know what that is, but you now need to find what does that look like as a complex number at the frequency of interest, which you said was 15. It's the third harmonic. So I now find H of J15. That's just a complex number. That now maybe, maybe that ends up being one half at an angle of minus 30 degrees. It's a complex number. It could be a magnitude and an angle. Now what do you do? Pardon? Now you know what the Y steady state of this third harmonic is, don't you? It's going to be 1.5, which is what we started with, times the magnitude of H at J15, which is 1 half, cosine, it's shaking at exactly the same frequency. It's a linear system. That's 15T. We started with an angle of 45, but now it's been modified passing through the system. The system has now delayed it by 30 degrees. 
And now what happens to our power? This is now the sinusoidal steady state behavior of the output's third harmonic. There are other pieces of the output, but here I'm just saying give me the third harmonic material or information. This is now the time domain version. It's 0.75 cosine 15t plus 15 degrees. What's the power in the output? What's our formula? Don't we just worry about that? We wouldn't even really have to worry about the phase information, would we? We simply take the magnitude, so if I say that's the magnitude of our output, and you could now draw the line spectra for the output, couldn't you? You could calculate all of these amplitudes and angles for each of the outputs, harmonics. But here I just said, look at the third harmonic. The power in the output's third harmonic, I don't know what notation to use, so I'll just say that's okay, is the amplitude squared divided by 2, right? And you're done. So in this case, it's this 1.5 over 2 squared divided by 2. Questions on that? And that's now watts. So that's 2.25 divided by 8, about a quarter, right? 2 over 8, roughly. So it's 250 milliwatts, back of the envelope calculation. Now we're really getting nervous, right? But you might want to know, what am I expecting? Ooh, if I put my hand on that, is it going to be hot? It depends. It depends on the device, but I'm just... Now you know you have 250 milliwatts at the third harmonic in your output. That may or may not be of interest. Questions? Are we good to go? You should be in a day. Well, in less than a day, right? You don't have a day to study, but I'm hoping it's all starting to gel. But do you see how you could now sit down and somebody could give you one problem and it could encompass all of the material that we've been talking about so far? Just for exam three. Wait for the final. Are there questions before we dismiss? You can still have the Laplace transform table, table 4.1. That's at the beginning of the notes. I'm sorry? I don't know what you're going to need. Some people might need that. Some people may not. I, it may just be sort of a pacifier. It may just make you feel warm and fuzzy going into the exam. But you may need it for the final, so you might as well get used to having it. Yes? What exam is this? This is how I keep track of it. It's the third exam, so I'm giving you three cheat sheets. Front and back, 8.5 by 11 inches. Other questions? These questions I can answer. Yes? So what do you decide to do when you're sketching the line spectra? You should be told on the exam whether you're drawing the compact trigonometric line spectra, which is also called the one-sided, you're just dealing with positive frequencies, or the two-sided line spectra, which is associated with the complex exponential line spectra. So you should be told which line spectra to use. If you're not told, you can use whichever one you're most comfortable with, but know how to do it. And the powers for the complex exponential are just the magnitude d sub n squared. You don't have this half going in there because you have both positive and negative frequencies. Pardon? And you've used the half, yes. I would. It just makes it easier, but you can keep track. Of this. So the question was, if you have the trigonometric Fourier series, you can do it all with sines and cosines. You know the amplitudes of those, but I would probably say, oh, convert it into the complex, 
or the compact trigonometric, then you only have one amplitude at one frequency to deal with. But it should be consistent if you did it in the long form. You would just be using each of those two terms, the sine and the cosine's magnitudes, squaring them and taking, dividing by half. And that should give you the same answer as the C sub n at that frequency squared divided by 2. Did I say divided by 1 half? Oh, divide by half. I don't want to say that, do I? Divide by 2. I want to multiply by 1 half. Is everybody clear? Did I just mess you up? I guess I need to take a break, huh? You knew what I meant. Good. Do what I meant, not what I said. How's that? Other questions? All right. I'll see you tomorrow. Good luck. Have fun studying. This is fun stuff.